in Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15 the scripture reads and I will give you this is God speaking pastors according to my heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding please be seated and the, today's title this morning that I present to you understanding the appreciation of our holy man and woman of God and the subtitle make room I believe we all can agree in the house, it's God's will to give. A very familiar pastor of scripture, John 3 and 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When Jesus was walking the earth in his public ministry in Matthew, the ninth chapter, verse 35, it says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues or churches, preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. And he was healing, manifestations of healing every sickness, healing every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, the Bible says he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. You know, when I look at the fact that the Lord was moved with compassion Again, because he saw people he, that was like sheep, that was scattered abroad, and they didn't have a leader, they didn't have a shepherd, and they fainted. It, makes me, it reminds me of the story of Exodus, the third chapter, verse 7, in the NLT. We know the man by the name of Moses. We know that the story talks about that how did the people, they cried in their affliction, and they cried, and they begin to... Uh, Lamentate based on the oppression. Matter of fact, I just want to read it to you in Exodus, the third chapter, verse 7 in the NLT. And it reads, And the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. And we have learned Egypt is a type of the world. He says, I have heard their cries of distress. Even not only distress, but just stress. How many times is just, just dealing with life can be stressful? But he says, I've, I've, I've seen, I've heard the cries of the distressed, and because of their harsh slave masters, and the Lord says, yes, I am aware of their sufferings. And then the Lord says, so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile, spacious land or their promised land, the promised life. And what's interesting, God says, I'm going to come down and deliver them. And then verse 10, it says, he tells Moses, now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. And he says, come on now. So come on, Moses, now go. And what's very helpful and beneficial, when I think about the fact that the Lord, again, he saw the people fainting and oppressed. It's like the Lord said, come here, uh, Presbyter Wells. Come here, Pastor D. Because in this region, I'm setting you. You have been set as the set man and the set woman of God. To speak into this region because there are people that are oppressed. There are people that are depressed. There are people that are stressed. And I want you, just like I told Moses, let my people go. I want you to tell my people to establish a kingdom mindset in order to release the stress, struggle, and strain in their lives. Come here, Moses. You see, one thing about the gift that God has given. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 8, when Jesus left the earth, he said, what was important to him? I'm going to set point men and women to the earth. The apostle Paul speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ, he spoke, he said, wherefore he said when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts or ministerial gifts unto men. In verse 11, he says he gave some apostles, he gave some prophets, he gave some evangelists, and he gave some pastors and teachers. And so this, in, in him giving, I just want to talk about what is giving the, the definition just to open it up. And then the Oxford Dictionary, giving stands for to hand something to somebody as a present. To hand something to somebody as a present. You see, saints of the Most High, because if you are a born-again believer, all of us are in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verse 27, in the NLT, it reads, All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. And because we are in his body, he has given us, individually as well as collectively, a gift in, in a form of a pastor. So this morning, I just want to simply talk to you. This morning, I want to talk to you the purpose of of the pastor. What was the original intent? What did God have in his mind and the Lord Jesus Christ? The perception 
of the pastor because if we perceive him right we can receive from him right and then the appreciation of the pastor if we value the gift if we see the worth and the value of the gift then maybe I can give right because I appreciate the pastor and if there's time a lot that we're going to talk about the revelation that makes the difference how we treat our pastor the purpose, again, the original intent of the thing, the reason, what God had in his mind. Again, he said in Jeremiah, I'm giving you pastors so you won't be scattered abroad, so you won't be stressed, struggle, or strain, so you won't have oppression and depression, and God forbid, but demonic possession. I'm giving you pastors that got the power of God on their lives. I'm giving you a pastor, just like I anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost and with power to go about doing good, healing all that are oppressed and depressed and demonically possessed of the devil I'm giving you pastors I'm giving you my gifts what's the purpose Lord to feed us with knowledge and understanding you see the Bible says in Hosea 4 and 6 God says my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge I'm giving you pastors pastors to feed us our faith through the knowledge of God's word and also in understanding how to apply the word that we heard each and every Sunday, each and every Wednesday, it's just not enough to hear the word of God, but teach me, feed me, help my understanding that I can apply the word that I heard on a daily basis. Not just on Sunday when everything is wonderful, everything is fine, the atmosphere is charged, but how do I take this atmosphere on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday? Teach me, oh Lord. Teach me more about you, how you work, how you move, that I might walk onward in your truth until everything within me, even on my job, even though my family will bring honor to your name teach me Lord you see understanding in Proverbs the fourth chapter verse 7 it says wisdom is the principal thing therefore get wisdom and with all thy getting get understanding you see understanding is a compound word under to yield and submit to stand a point of view or a position taken as we understand the perception and the appreciation of our holy man and woman of God may we be willing to abandon the world way of thinking about clergy in the earth you see saints just because the clergy in the earth do something illegal immoral or unethical it doesn't mean all clergy are walking that way Oh, let me help you out. Sometimes we may have doctors that don't do something right, but let me tell you, if you get sick, I'm going to the emergency care. Come on now. Sometimes we may have policemen that not, may not be doing right, but let me say, someone try to break in my house, I'm calling 911. So again, God is challenging us. How about our understanding? How do you see your man and woman of God? You see, he wants us to submit and yield to God's point of view and take his position on how we receive the gift he has given to us in the form of a pastor. You see, Romans 12 and 2 says, Be not conformed to this world. Press into the mold, the image, and the likeness, but be ye transformed, changed, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You see, in the NLT, the same, wrote, the same scripture, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, listen, it says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. Watch this, by changing the way you think. You see, we got to be able to give an answer upon your job and your families when they watch television and see men of God falling and felting, and they want to hear what you have to say. But God says, "Let the word in your mouth. Let it be. With, let the word of your mouth be with, with grace, that you may be able to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope that lies within you, with fear and with trembling when you speak about your man and woman of God, because the Bible says, "Touch not my anointed, and do my prophet no harm." Change your way of thinking that you may learn to know what God's will is for you, what is good and pleasing and perfect in your sight. When we do the change, when we embrace the past, it's about the understanding may it help our perception and appreciation again of our holy man and woman of God. Let's deal with perception. Perception, again, is defined in the Oxford Dictionary, intuitive understanding and insight I think we're familiar with this I just had to endure the witness my spirit bear witness it's just something different about you 
I can't really put my finger on it, but your light is shining. I know some of us on your work, sometimes people look at you and say, are you a man of God? Are you a woman of God? Because they see something that's different about you and them. You and them. You and them. What's different about you? God says, come out. What's different about you than them? Let your light so shine. So let's deal with perception. If you have your Bibles, again, open up to 2 Kings chapter 8. I mean, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8. Praise the Lord. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8. And as you turn in there, I just want to share briefly the story, just a little backdrop. This is a story about a wealthy woman who had a husband that they lived together in a country called Shunam. And what happened by happenstance, we learned this church by chance, but by the providential hand of God, because nothing just happens to the believer. How many know that your steps are ordered by the Lord? So she bumped into this man, the prophet named Elisha, and one thing that's key and critical, she perceived that he was a holy man of God. Let's get started. So in verse 8, it says, in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8, it says, And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where it was a great woman or a rich woman, and she constrained him or urged him to eat bread. And so it was that as often as he's passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. After that, for an example, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. So he would turn in there. That's key and critical that he turned in there. And then verse 9, it says, And she said unto her husband, watch it now, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passed by us continually. I perceive. The first word I want to break down is the word behold. When you see that word behold now, God is trying to arrest our attention. You see, behold now means give attention to. Meaning my body right now, I'm at church, but some of us, our mind may be out of church. So God is saying right now, I'm about to drop some nuggets on you that's going to help you now and help in your future. Your miracles are around the corner. If you would just simply behold what this man of God is about to tell you, if you would just give attention to it, you would think about what I'm about to share and look at. God says your whole world will turn around for the better if you will receive the word of the Lord. Again, behold, and we talked about perceive. Perceive is the Hebrew word yada, Y-A-D-A. And that word means to know by observation and reflection. Look at this woman of God, this intuitive witness, to know by observation. She's observing this man of God walking by her every day. Reflection. She began to reflect upon this man of God. There's something different between him and me. To know by experience. She heard about his report. To know by investigation. Because one thing about a woman, we're going to investigate the matter. And also, and also to prove if this person is who he said he is we're going to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good she said to know this isn't an ordinary man this is a holy man of God which is set apart how many of you know that your man of God God says in Acts the 13th chapter verse 22 the D version it says God says I have found a man after my own heart but wait a minute now the first thing that God says he is a man meaning he's not a God he is a man, just like same afflictions as we have. He is a man. What's very significant about that, the man, because many times Presbyter says, I am the under shepherd. First Corinthians 11, 1 Paul says, be you followers of me as I follow Christ. Be you followers of me as I follow Christ. Why is that significant? Because the apostle Paul said again in the Galatians, the chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, but though we or an angel from heaven preach, any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him or her be a curse as we said before we say now again if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received let him or her be a curse you see saints the pastor's job is not to see how close he can get you to him the pastor's job is to see how close he can get you to your God because your pastor is not going to be home with you Monday night your pastor is not going to be home when you get that phone call when you need to get a prayer through when you've learned how to be able to make a prayer of it you can get access into the heavens because you have been taught and fed the word of the living God her perception brought about her preparation. Here we go. She was next in line for a miracle. Verse 10 in NLT. How many right now you want you want how many right now you believe God you're next in line for a miracle? Verse 10, a miracle in my marriage. That's not might be for everybody, but somebody. I need a miracle in my marriage. I need a miracle with my child, my children. 
Everybody child is not saying hallelujah. There's somebody child that's in them streets right now. Somebody child is in prison right now. I need a miracle, God. I need a miracle. If you're a miracle working God, if you make a way out of no way, I need a miracle. I need a manifestation of a sign. Put your signature on my house, Lord. I need a manifestation of a wonder. I need a miracle from God. If God doesn't do it, it cannot be done. This is not a job for a man. This is a job for God. I need a miracle. So here we go in verse 10. Here comes the miracle. She said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops by, verse 11, NLT, verse 11, NLT, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 11, it says, let's build, here we go, a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. He will have a place. Saints, do God have a place in our hearts? Have we made room for him in our hearts that he has a place that he was to pass by? He can stop right on by. Does he have a place? Meaning Jesus says foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head because my head is in charge and I refuse to submit to his lordship. And all the while he wants to know, can I have a place? Can you make space? Can you make room in your heart that I may have access, that I may have a place? So this woman, this rich woman that had an intuition, she had a great perception. This was a wealthy woman, a holy man of God. She recognized, so because of her perception, she showed appreciation she did what? She made room. She furnished it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. That he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. So she showed the appreciation. So what she did, she renovated her house. Renovation defines as the act or process of repairing, renewing, or restoring to a good condition. Is there something in my heart in order for God to have access that he can come dwell and sit with you that needs to be repaired? Is there something within me that needs to be renewed and restored back to the original intent that God had on his mind? You see, one thing about it, before we show forth appreciation for the man of God, we must show forth our appreciation for God. When we recognize the full worth and value of our God. Wait a minute, God says, let me be the example and the example. I recognize the full worth of who you are. Remember, God so loved the world, and we are in that world that he gave. God identified how valuable your worth was. How do you see yourself? God see you as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation to show forth the praises unto him that have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God God says, I delivered you from the power of darkness, just like he delivered Israel out of Egypt. He says, I delivered you out of the power of darkness, and I transferred you, where, Lord, into the kingdom of my dear son. How do you see yourself? Remember, it got to cost you something. And see, what did it cost the Lord? Without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. In the NLT, 1 Peter chapter 2, 18 through 19, it got to cost me something. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. It got to cost me something. Something. You see, if we are going to experience a renovation in our hearts, a renovation in our souls, and a renovation in our lives, it must be a process. You go through the process. You will have progress as long as you go through the process. But I will tell you, don't skip the steps. As God is taking you through the process, don't skip the steps. The process. Don't skip the steps. In the process because he's repairing Lord repair my heart I want to make room with you he's renewing Lord renew my heart he's restoring Lord renew God restore my relationship restore my marriage restore God my children restore God so the Bible says in 2 Corinthians the 6th chapter verse 16 through 18 now Paul is talking to the Corinthian church 
This is the church that he's talking to, full of grace and full of power. He says, what agreement have the temple of God with idols? We're trying to make room for the Lord in our hearts. This was the church that was having idols. And we know idols is anything we put before God. Our cars that we can put before God. Our jobs we can put before God. Our money we can put before God. Anything that we put before God. Idols. He says, don't you know? He says, you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in him. What's your heart, Lord? I will walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Just like the wealthy woman, she made room and he just passed on by but but he sat there because of the room that she made for him and when we know that God says we're the temple of the living God because of who you are because he wants to dwell in you now apostle Paul he gets tough about the topic he says because of who you are he says therefore I want you to do what I want you to come out from among them and be ye separate says the Lord so it's just not your pastor that God sets apart but each and every believer God is trying to set you apart so you can do your part in the house of God but he says come out come out come out he says in order to make room for me I need you to come out from among them and then he says touch not the unclean thing because once I have delivered you don't go back and touch the unclean thing he says I will receive you and will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters says the Lord Almighty and I believe we can agree our principal has been doing a phenomenal job in this series the, uh, in this series that he's currently have embarked upon pneumaticos life which is the spiritual life of the believer if we, gonna, if we are going to experience the fullness of the pneumaticos life which is the spiritual life of the believer when God says come out remember he said come out of what sexual sins watch out now I'm not going to hit it too much but sexual immorality impurity lustful pleasures come out from spiritual sins idolatry sorcery hostility quarreling jealousy outbursts of anger selfish ambition decisions and division come out of social sins empty drunkenness and wild parties come out come out come out in order for me to allow to renovate you to repair you renew you and restore you I need you to come out Jesus was passing by the church when he had this earthly ministry and as he was passing by he stepped into one of the temples and they were selling there was merchandising in God's house and Jesus because of his heart because of that righteous indignation he took the table and flipped it over and he declared my house shall be called the house of prayer but you have made it the den of thieves I wonder when he looks at our house individually and collectively what does he see when he's trying to make room to come in our hearts he says you can't have two masters you can't have two masters you will either serve the one and love the other you can't be lukewarm you can't be lukewarm you can't be hot or cold but you gotta make a choice we have to make a choice to be hot so again let's talk about the house remember she made room and listen she furnished it with the bed the table and the chair and the lamp the Lord is asking you is your house furnished? I'm not talking about your physical house, but your spiritual house. Is your house furnished? What do you mean, man of God? You see, Pastor D preached a message. God's urgency is now. And she talked about in furnishing the house, Matthew the 13th chapter, verse 43 through 45, it reads, When the unclean spirit is going out of a man, he walked through dry places, seeking rest and findeth none then he saith I will return unto my house from whence I came out and when he is come he findeth it empty swept and garnished then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter in and dwell there where God says I want to dwell there I want to walk in you. I want to dwell there. But because my house is not furnished, here come these familiar spirits that troubled me all my life, but now it's seven times worse. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. But God is saying, I want you to put furniture. I want you to fill your house. 
How do I fill my house? Colossians, the third chapter, verse 16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you. How, Lord? Richly fill your house with wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms. Let's start right there. Fill the house with Psalms. Psalms chapter 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But listen, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he do what? Meditate day and night. And he, she shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that his leaf or her leaf shall not wither. Planted in the wood. Fill the house that the adversary won't have access in your life. I think this bears repeating. My daughter sometimes said, Dad, you told that story. I don't get tired of telling it. Some may get tired of hearing it, but I don't get tired of telling it. Fill the house because if your house not filled, ultimately God is asking, are you sold out for the Lord? Are you sold out for the Lord Jesus Christ? Is your house filled with the word of God? Paul says, fill the house. Be not drunk with wine. Watch out, which is in excess. But be filled with the spirit. Pneumaticos, the spiritual life in the believer. Be filled with the spirit. How, Lord? Speaking to yourselves in Psalms. We can remember Psalms 91. Speaking to yourself. He that dwelleth in this. There you go. The word dwell. God wants to dwell in your house. He that dwell in the secret place. Where, Lord? Where's the secret place? God says, you want to know? God says, behold, there is a place by me and thou shalt stand on the rock because when the winds descend, when the rains come and the winds blow, your house will not fall and fail because you're solid. You're standing on the rock. The Lord Jesus Christ, fill the house. Fill the house. So we pick up in 13 because here comes the miracle. NLT verse 13. Again, 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to start with verse 13. So, because she showed appreciation, she valued the worth of the man of God. So it, so it moved his heart. He said, Elisha said to Gehazi, his servant, tell her. Matter of fact, we go, thank you. So I'm going to start with verse 12. Matter of fact, verse 11 is even better. So one day, Elisha returned to Shunem. And he went up to this upper room to rest. Watch out, the upper room in Acts. He said to his servant Gehazi, tell the woman from Shunem, I want to speak to her. When she appeared, Elisha said to Gehazi, tell her, we appreciate, watch out now, we appreciate you saw me at the worth and the value, the kind concern you have shown us. Listen, the miracle, what can we do for you? And this is what it said. Can we put a good word for you to the king? Excuse me, to the commander of the army? She said, no, she replied. My family takes good care of me. <laughs> Lady Elisha asked Gehazi, I got to do something because you can't beat God's given to how much you try. What can I do for her? Gehazi replied, listen, she doesn't have a son. And her husband is an old man. Let me ask this question. Is there something that you have been believing God for for such a long, mighty long time and it has not yet come to pass and it's so long you have put it on the shelf and you almost have forgot about it. And listen to this response she said. He said in verse 15, call her again and Elisha told, told him. When the woman returned, Elisha said to her, as she stood in the doorway next year at this time watch out now you will be holding a son in your arms listen to her response no my lord she cried oh man of god don't deceive me don't get my hopes up like that because i've had my hopes in time past i've been in prayer lines i've given offerings and the manifestation did not come to pass. And look at my husband. He's old now. Don't get, I've been having all types of people to come lay hands. And he still, she still, still has not got healed. Don't get my hopes up, man of God. In verse 17, but sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And that time, the following year, she had a son. Just like Elijah said. 
the man of God. God did not allow the word to fall to the ground, but accomplish that which he had performed. You see, the woman, she had no child. Again, her husband is old, and which we just mentioned, what do you believe in God that has not come to pass? Listen, because she in turn gave her seed, it was an answer to her need. What was the seed? She made room, she had furniture, she gave the bed, she gave the table. She gave because she had a need, God gave her seed. Listen, listen, listen. Because she made room for the man of God, God made room in her womb. Because she made room for the man of God, God made room in her womb. You see, her perception, because she saw the man, the man of God right, her perception brought about conception. Because she perceived him right. How do you see your man and woman of God? How do you see them? Do you just see him just another man of God? Do you just see him my road dog, my friend? Jesus said to the disciples, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they begin to say, his disciples that are supposed to be with him. Some say there are John the Baptist. Some say there are the prophets. Some say there are Elijah. But he said, that's what some say about me. But whom say ye that I am? And Jesus, Peter looks up and he says, thou art the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood have not revealed it unto you. It's the revelation that makes the difference. How do you see your man and woman of God? Because you see him right, you might can receive right. The miracle that you've been believing God for for your marriage. The miracle that you've been believing God for your home. The miracle that you've been believing God for that job. Oh, the waters are troubling. The waters are troubling. The waters are troubling. When she gave, she made room and God made room in her womb. Because she saw the man of God right. How do you see your man of God? You see, watch out for the spirit of familiarity. When you have walked with your man and woman of God for years. And you have begun to hear things behind closed doors. And now you have become friends. Watch out. Because God in leadership 101, like Noah, you remember Noah, when God began to use Noah. And, when, and after that experience, and when, they, when the flood was over, it talks about three sons. And one son, it talks about they saw the nakedness of their father. And when he saw the nakedness of his father, leadership 101, when he saw the nakedness, what did he do? He exposed the nakedness of his father. But the other two sons in leadership 101, they went back, walked backwards, and covered the nakedness of their father. Are you assigned close enough to your man of God to cover them, or are you there used by the enemy to expose them? Touch not my anointed. And do my prophet no harm. Watch out for the spirit of familiarity. Watch out. Because Jesus went to Nazareth, his own hometown. And he says, there he could do no mighty works. Because they say, is this not the carpenter's son? We saw you grow up. Is this your mother, your sisters, your brothers with us? He says, there he could do no mighty works. Because of the spirit of familiarity. He's just my homeboy. He's my road dog. No, he is my pastor who brings me, who feeds me my faith, who feeds me knowledge, who feeds me understanding. He is my pastor, so I want to make sure I perceive them right so I can receive from them right. I want to make sure I appreciate them and I value the worth. I appreciate them. And because she made room for the man of God, the Lord would say, will you make room for me today? Will you make room for me today? I close out with this thought. It's called the law of reciprocity. You see, law is a fixed principle. It leaves no debate or discussion or negotiation. We know this, what goes up must come down. You can't beat God's blessing, not how much you try. So we're going to have an opportunity next week to bless our pastor, then pastor appreciation. And I'm asking a question right now. Pastor did not ask me to preach this message. He asked me, do you have a word from God? I said, yes. So he didn't ask per se. He trusts me with the message. The law of reciprocity. Reciprocity is changing things for mutual benefits. We hear this from our very lovely Pastor D, Luke the 6th chapter, verse 38 in the NLT. It says, give. This is what the rich woman did. She gave a room. She gave furniture. Give, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full press down, shaking together. Watch this. To make room for more running over, poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Again, she had the perception. 
that produced a conception in her life. Because she believed him to be a man of God, she allowed her appreciation, recognizing the full worth and the value by her giving something, and it made room in her womb. It made room in her womb. If this revelation is true, and we have the right perception through revelation, that this is my holy man and woman of God, it's right to show we appreciate the gift. Remember Pastor D said last Sunday, the five love languages by Gary Chapman. And one of the love languages is acts of service. She said, like John P. Key, I need you next Sunday. Show up. She said, if you truly love me, if you love me, acts of service. When me and my daughter, I'm sorry, me and my family, when we were stationed in Missouri, we looked at, you know, every state got something. I think Virginia, State for Love or something like that. But Virginia, well, Missouri is the show me state. You got to show me that you love me. You got to show me that you appreciate me. Most wives will tell their husband, show me. If you appreciate, if you appreciate me, she simply asked of us, she need us to show up. But listen, she also gave guidance. Each one, reach one. It's a beautiful thing. All of us will be here next Sunday. But can we honor her by bringing someone with us? And then, of course, press the well. He's believing God for 300. And I come in agreement with him. So may we show our appreciation to our man and woman of God. Glory be to God. Please stand as we close.